Why we yawn? Yawning is one of those things every human does but nobody fully understands. You open your mouth like a bored lion, suck in a lungful of air, and for some reason anyone watching suddenly feels the need to join in. The classic explanation is oxygen. The idea goes, when you're tired, your breathing slows down, your brain isn't getting enough fresh air, so your body forces you to yawn as a big reset button. Sounds neat, but scientists don't really buy it. Studies show yawning doesn't actually give your brain a magical oxygen boost. The stronger theory is that yawning is basically a brain cooler. When you're drowsy or stressed, your brain heats up. A giant gulp of air and a big stretch of your jaw helps cool the blood in your head, like opening a window in a stuffy room. That could explain why you yawn more in warm environments. And then there's the contagious bit. See someone else yawn? Your brain's mirror neurons, little copycat circuits kick in, and suddenly you're yawning too. It's social glue, like your body's way of saying, same mate, I'm tired as well. So the next time you yawn, don't worry, you're not oxygen deprived. You're just giving your brain a quick blast of AC and syncing up with the tribe. How Bluetooth works. Bluetooth is basically your gadgets whispering secrets to each other through invisible radio waves. No wires, no internet. Just a short range conversation happening right under your nose. It works by using a slice of the radio spectrum, the same invisible stuff that powers Wi-Fi and walkie-talkies. But unlike Wi-Fi, Bluetooth keeps things local. It only works within about 10 meters, so your headphones aren't wasting energy shouting across the street, they're just politely mumbling to your phone in the same room. When you turn it on, your device starts broadcasting a little hello I exist signal. Another device hears it, they shake hands digitally, and that's called pairing. Once they remember each other, reconnecting is easy, kind of like two friends who don't need to reintroduce themselves every time they meet. So in short, Bluetooth is your device's secret language. It's clever, efficient, and almost invisible, until it randomly refuses to connect, and you're left waving your phone around like an idiot, hoping the headphones pick up the signal. Why we sound different on recordings. You know that awful moment when you hear your voice played back and think, who's this stranger, and why are they impersonating me badly? Bad news, that's you. Here's why. When you speak, you actually hear yourself in two different ways. The first is normal. Sound waves leave your mouth, travel through the air, and enter your ears like everyone else hears them. The second is sneaky. Those same vibrations travel through the bones and tissues of your skull straight into your inner ear. This bone conduction adds extra depth and bass, basically giving you your own private surround sound system. So, to your brain, your voice has always sounded richer, warmer, and way less annoying. But a microphone, it doesn't live in your skull, it only picks up the air-conducted version, the one everyone else hears. No secret bass boost, no flattering echo chamber. Just the raw truth. That's why playback sounds so alien. You're used to your deluxe edition voice, and the recording is the budget version everyone else has been putting up with your whole life. So the next time you cringe at your own voice on video, remember, it's not that you sound weird on tape, you've just been spoiled by the private concert hall inside your head. Why people are left-handed? About 1 in 10 people on earth are left-handed, and for some reason that still feels like a mystery. Most of us just pick up a pen as kids and naturally favor the right hand. But a smaller group go, nope, this one feels better, and stick with the left. So, why? Part of it comes down to the brain. Your left brain hemisphere controls the right side of your body, and your right hemisphere controls the left. For most people, the left hemisphere is dominant, which makes them right-handed. But for lefties, things are a bit more balanced, or flipped. Their brains distribute control differently, meaning the left hand gets promoted to main character. Genetics plays a role too. If your parents are left-handed, your odds of being a lefty go up, though it's not guaranteed. It's not a single left-hand gene, more like a messy cocktail of DNA that nudges you one way or the other. But it's not just biology. Culture has had its say as well. For centuries, being left-handed was considered unlucky, weird, or even evil in some societies. Schools used to force kids to switch to their right hand, which is why older generations had fewer lefties on record. Thankfully, we've stopped bullying people for holding a spoon differently. Being left-handed can actually come with perks. Studies show lefties are overrepresented in certain creative fields, and even in sports that involve fast reflexes, like tennis and boxing. Why? Because most opponents are used to playing against right-handers, so facing a lefty feels like fighting in a mirror. So if you're left-handed, congratulations, you're not broken, cursed or odd. You're just part of a rare minority whose brains decided to zig when most people zag. Why we hiccup? Hiccups are basically your diaphragm throwing a temper tantrum. The diaphragm is the big dome-shaped muscle sitting under your lungs that helps you breathe down when you inhale, up when you exhale. Most of the time it's perfectly civil, but every now and then it spasms out of nowhere. When that happens, you suck in a sudden gulp of air, your vocal cords slam shut, and out pops that ridiculous little hick sound. It's like your body hitting the pause button without asking. Why does it happen? Well, pick your poison. Eating too fast, laughing too hard, drinking something fizzy, stuffing yourself until your stomach bulges. It can all irritate the diaphragm. Sometimes it's just your nervous system misfiring for no clear reason. Scientists aren't completely sure, but one theory is that hiccups are a leftover reflex from our amphibian ancestors, little tadpole-like creatures that had to learn how to breathe air and water. 
Basically, your body still carries a useless glitch from millions of years ago. The good news, most hiccups vanish on their own. The bad news, humans have spent centuries inventing bizarre cures anyway. Hold your breath, drink water upside down, scare the life out of someone. Do they work? Sometimes. Or maybe the hiccups just gave up on their own and your mate took all the credit. So hiccups aren't dangerous. They're just your diaphragm throwing shade, reminding you it's still in charge of your breathing schedule. Why planes fly? Think about it. Planes are giant metal tubes stuffed with people, luggage, and pretzels. By all logic, they should drop like bricks. And yet they don't. They float gracefully through the sky at 30,000 feet, as if physics itself is playing favorites. So how? The magic is in the wings. Airplanes are designed with wing shapes called airfoils, which are curved on top and flatter underneath. As the plane speeds forward, air rushing over the top of the wing moves faster than the air underneath. Faster air creates lower pressure, slower air creates higher pressure, and suddenly, you've got lift, the invisible upward force that cancels out gravity. Basically, the wings trick the air into holding the plane up, but wings alone aren't enough. You need thrust, the engines, or else you're just a sad metal kite. Jet engines gulp air, mix it with fuel, and blast it out the back, pushing the plane forward. The faster the plane moves, the more lift the wings generate. It's a tag team. Engines provide the shove, wings provide the float. Then you've got the tail fins, rudders and flaps, little steering tools that keep the plane stable and pointing the right way. Without them, pilots would basically be flying very expensive falling frisbees. So in short, planes fly because wings bully the air into holding them up while engines shove them along. It's equal parts clever engineering and physics trickery, which is why the next time you're sitting by the window, don't panic. You're not in a floating brick. You're in a controlled air illusion powered by speed, pressure, and a lot of maths. How black holes work. Black holes are space's ultimate do not enter signs. They're regions where gravity is so strong, not even light can escape. Imagine the universe pulling a cosmic plug and everything nearby just spirals down the drain. That's a black hole. They usually form when massive stars collapse at the end of their lives. The star burns through its fuel, can't fight gravity anymore, and boom, its core collapses into an infinitely dense point called a singularity. Around it is the event horizon, basically the point of no return. Once you cross it, you're done. Even if you were the fastest beam of light, you're not getting out. Now here's the weird bit. To the outside observer, stuff falling into a black hole seems to slow down and stretch like cosmic spaghetti, never quite crossing the event horizon. To the unlucky object itself, it's just falling normally until it gets crushed into oblivion. Time and space don't play by normal rules here. They bend, warp and twist under the black hole's insane gravity. Black holes aren't just cosmic vacuum cleaners though. They can power some of the brightest things in the universe. As matter swirls into them, it heats up and releases staggering amounts of energy, sometimes blasting out radiation and jets of particles that outshine entire galaxies. So ironically, the darkest objects in the universe can also create the brightest shows. So black holes aren't literal holes, and they're not black in the empty sense. They're massive, invisible monsters of gravity, swallowing anything that gets too close while bending the very fabric of reality around them. They're terrifying, mysterious, and for now, thankfully, very, very far away. Why time feels faster as we get older? Remember being a kid and summer holidays felt like they lasted forever. Now blink twice and Christmas is already back. It's not that time itself is speeding up. It's that your brain is playing a cruel trick on you. When you're young, everything is new. First day of school, first bike ride, first time you realize vegetables are terrible, all fresh experiences. Newness makes your brain pay attention, and that attention stretches time out. A year at age seven feels massive because it's packed with firsts. As you get older though, routine takes over. You wake up, go to work, binge the same shows, scroll the same feeds. Fewer new experiences mean your brain compresses the days together into a blur. Another Tuesday looks a lot like last Tuesday, so the months fly by. There's also a maths twist. One year at age 10 is literally 10% of your entire life. At 50, it's just 2%. So proportionally, each year feels smaller compared to the whole pie. That's why your 20s drag on, but your 40s vanish before you've even finished your coffee. The fix? Novelty. Studies show trying new things, travel, hobbies, even changing your routine can slow down your perception of time. Basically, you need to trick your brain into noticing life again. So no, the universe isn't secretly pressing fast forward. You're just stuck in autopilot. Shake things up a little, and you might just feel those days stretch again. 